Hello, Patricia Rati. I'm Jazz Glati, and in this Ask Jazz series, I'm going to answer a question that was sent on the Telegram group. It was Jazz, what are some things that you do differently now compared to what you were taught at dental school? And the honest answer is so much. Right At dental school, you lack experience big time, right? Think about how many procedures you actually get to do at dental school, how many crowns you actually get to fit. So dental school is just there to make you a safe beginner. And as you navigate through the real world, you combine your previous experiences with some mentors and courses that you go on and your own individual experiences that you get in practice, which are so powerful. You know, your failures teach you so much. Your network teaches you so much. And eventually, you become the average of the five dentists you spend the most time with. But I decided to make a list. And the list I made was uh, of five main things that I do differently now compared to at dental school. And I think these are all things that have a lesson attached to it or some sort of value attached to it. So let's start the list. Number one of the five things that I do differently now compared to a dental school is extractions. Now, at dental school where I trained in Sheffield, we were mostly taught forceps because they were worried about us using luxators and causing damage or an injury, right? Like if you slip with a luxator, that can cause a lot of harm. Now, towards the end of dental school, with some mentors, they were showing us how to use luxators, which is great. So luxators became a part of my arsenal during dental school. But I'll tell you what made me significantly improve my extractions and has made me pretty much fearless. I guess maybe fearless might be an irresponsible term, right? And sometimes the word fearless can mean irresponsible. I don't mean it at all. I just mean that, you know, Previously, when I see a, a molar radiograph for an extraction, I used to have, you know, palpitations. I used to get nervous. Can I remove it? Can I not? Should I refer this? Should I not? Kind of thing. But now, I don't get phased by extractions. Even wisdom teeth, I'm quite competent with. And only those which are close to the ID canal or show signs that they're close would I refer. And the number one thing which allowed me to become confident with extractions and was not taught to me at dental school is sectioning and elevating. Now, there's a whole episode we have on the podcast with Chris Waith uh, about exactly this topic, right? How to make extractions easier by sectioning and elevating. And I wish I learned this technique sooner. I remember being one or two years qualified and take, trying to take out this lower molar and the crown completely broke off, leaving the roots behind. And looking back, all I need to do, all I generally just need to do is section the roots in a buckolingual direction so that now the mesial and the distal root are separate and literally just luxate out. Because quite often there's some bulbosities or slight curvatures that prevent the roots from lifting up vertically. So by sectioning them, you create two parts of insertion and you convert a multi-rooted extraction into two times single root extractions if we're dealing with the lower or three roots when we're dealing with an upper. So taking this on board now, I say that I actually section 80% of the molars that I remove, even from the start. If I if it's not budging, I'm not getting enough movement within the first 15 seconds or so, I my threshold for sectioning is very low. I'll be very, very quick to section. The added benefits of sectioning is that you don't need to do those horrible buccopalatal buccolingual movements because that's only going to harm your valuable, your precious buccal bone, which is required for a future implant. So by sectioning, I can actually direct the forces in the right way, prevent any damage to the bone, preserve more bone, and make my extractions much easier. And I do feel that the patients heal better. There's less trauma. The trauma is directed at the tooth, at the enamel, at the dentine, not at the bone and the surrounding tissues. So if you're not already doing this, sectioning and elevating is super important. If you want to see some examples of me sectioning and elevating teeth, there's some on YouTube. There's also some on the Protrusive app as well in the premium clinical section. And I'm also going to be adding one next week for a lower left second molar, very carious, very broken down for you to check out. The second thing I do now, which I didn't have access to at dental school, which I firmly believe in so much, is air abrasion. Now, the clinical evidence in terms of does air abrasion really improve the long-term outcomes for our adhesive restorations, it's to be debated, right? We don't know whether the bond strengths are always increase. Some studies say they do, some studies say they don't. And I know some colleagues who have never air abraded. They just don't have an air abrasion unit, you know, aluminum oxide particles. And just to be clear for any younger colleagues, air abrasion is not like the air polisher. It's a little bit more sophisticated than that. It's a little bit more power than that usually. And it's using a different type of sand, if you like. It's usually aluminum oxide particles. Now, if you're fancy and you've got an aquacare unit, I'm very jealous of you. That's probably the Rolls Royce of all air abrasion units. But something like a Ronvig is very good, a micro etcher. These are a couple of examples of air abrasion units. And what it does, it blasts 
dust, this, these sand particles, and supposedly it may aid in dentine bonding, and it may or may not help in enamel bonding. But the number one reason why I'm a big fan of aerobrasion, oh, by the way, actually, uh, cement removal. Like if you have a reservoir bridge or an old crown and you want to re-cement it, and you want to get rid of that old cement, then aerobrasion is amazing, right? You just blast off the cement. And of course, if you're bonding zirconia, then part of the zirconia bonding protocol is aerobrasion. So aerobrasion is a no-brainer personally, but the number one reason why I use aerobrasion is plaque and biofilm removal. So even if it doesn't materialize that aerobrasion actually makes your composites last longer, one thing that cannot be doubted is that it aids in biofilm removal. So this is something that David Clark, one of the inventors of the BioClear matrix, got me onto. I was watching some of his videos and he showed where you take a scaler to the tooth and you disclose the tooth and there's still plaque. And you scale some more, you use ultrasonic scaler, use all sorts of tools, and there's still plaque when you disclose. But only once you use air abrasion is all that plaque gone. Now, why is that important? Do you really want to bond to plaque? Do you want to bond to biofilm? Of course not, because obviously that means weaker bond strengths. But number one thing is staining, right? I don't get much staining on my composites, and I do believe it's because I'm obsessive about getting a nice, clean area. So air abrasion will help you get that cleanliness that you desire, that clean and rough surface that David Jadole talked about in our episode called Extreme Bonding. Again, all these episodes I'm referencing, I will put in the show notes. So number one was sectioning and elevating. Number two is air abrasion. Number three. Number three is the use of a wedge guard or a fender wedge. These are like two different brand names of these wedges. Essentially, it's a plastic wedge with a thin metal shield. Now, you can imagine where I'm going with this. Now, I do remember seeing some at dental school, but they were very much hidden away. And most of my tutors that were teaching me and helping me with my preparations weren't advocating the use of it. And so I didn't really get to use it much. I probably was using it wrong anyway. But these are absolutely fantastic. Now, there is some evidence to say that when we are drilling the proximal, the interproximal surface of a, of a tooth, we end up scratching the adjacent tooth a significant percentage of the time. No matter how good you think you are, no matter how much magnification you use, if you're not using some sort of protection like a wedge guard or a fender wedge, that metal strip really does help because we end up scratching the adjacent tooth many times over. Now, going back many years, the thing that scared me the most about crown preparations was breaking the contact because I was so scared about touching the adjacent tooth. I was really, really worried. And we all go through an experience where we take off a little bit too much compared to what we would like. And then we have to get the soft flex disc out and the fluoride and tell the patient what happened and stuff. So it's not nice. So what we end up doing to prevent touching the adjacent tooth is we end up over tapering that distal wall, for example, quite a common way we overcome it, which is not ideal because then you lose some tension of your crown. And quite often you also over reduce that distal wall, for example, because you're really trying to stay away from the adjacent tooth. And so that's not good either. That tooth structure could have been maintained. But when I switched to using the wedge guard, pretty much 90 plus percent of the times now when I'm doing a onlay prep, a crown prep, or when I'm even removing an old restoration, I just stick this wedge guard in. Now you can use some uh, tweezers or, or better yet, some mosquitoes or hemostats, give it a good pinch and direct it in. And you want to sort of go like you're suturing, right? You want to put the tip of the wedge in and then you want to go slightly apical and then you want to put your buckle pressure and then like you would with the suture needle, you'd go up. So you go sort of uh, down and up. It's difficult to explain. For those of you watching the video version, I've got something up right now of me recording, uh, inserting a wedge guard, which again, I'm a huge believer in. And it's definitely something I do now, which I didn't appreciate before at dental school and even as a newly qualified dentist, which would have saved me a lot of tears. So if you're not using one already, it is wonderful. I can break the contact with much more precision much more ease, much quicker, and less fear that I'm going to adjust the adjacent tooth. I don't mind if I batter the metal or if I batter the plastic. I've got some protection there. It is just much better to use something like a wedge guard. Now, if like I was, you're also anxious about breaking the contact. I've been speaking to some young dentists and students, and this is something that definitely worries them, that I've got a whole series coming on the Protrusive app soon called Breaking Contact. Basically, all it is, it's about 15, 20 cases of me doing crown preps. And all I'm showing you is 20 examples of breaking the contact and how I didn't touch the adjacent tooth, use of a wedge guard and use of any other techniques I can show you to safely break the contact without over tapering and without reducing too much tooth structure. So watch out on protrusive.app soon for that. And if you think that would be helpful, please comment below so I can hurry that process up for you. Number four, 
the use of onlays. Like onlays were just not taught to me at dental school at all whatsoever. So I had to go in courses by Jason Smithson and all these amazing dentists to learn about the adhesive onlay. And it's one of my favorite procedures to do. I've got rubber dam on and working on enamel, beautiful, clean dentistry. I love this procedure. You know, the single onlay is just a beautiful procedure to do. It's a way for me to express my creativity, if you like, right? When I'm doing an onlay, I'm in the zone because I feel good that I'm preserving the apical third, the gingival third of the tooth because we're avoiding a shoulder or a chamfer. And we're doing contemporary dentistry. We're doing adhesive dentistry. And adhesive dentistry is fun. There's a lot of science, there's a lot of art form, there's a lot of protocol checklists involved. So it really satisfies that inner OCD that we all have. So I'm doing on laser. I just did not do them at dental school at all. And so if you're newly qualified, I would encourage you to go on a course where you learn about different on -lays. Now I do both metal on -lays, rarely, usually when I've got limited uh, occlusal space and I want to put in some slots and grooves. But lithium disilica is a material I'll commonly use for my on -lays. And if I've got a good amount of enamel all the way around and the thickness of the enamel is good as well, then that for me is automatically going to be an onlay where I need some sort of cuspal protection or an indirect restoration. If you want to see a full protocol, 35 or so minute video, CPD verifiable of me bonding an onlay and also prepping onlays, then do check out the Protrusive app. That's protrusive.app for examples of that. So just to recap before I say number five. So number one was how I extract is different to how I did it at dental school. I am sectioning and elevating. Number two was air abrasion. So important for that plaque removal and stain reduction. Number three is a use of a wedge guard. Very trusty wedge guard. I use it so much. It just gives me so much peace of mind. And number four is on Onlays. There's a beauty in onlay preps and really it's not difficult at all. If you can do a crown, you can definitely do an onlay. It's just a big deal because if you haven't done my dental school, it's like your first time doing an onlay kind of thing. So it's good to see all the content out there and courses out there that teach you this kind of stuff. So number five and the final one of something I do now, which I had no idea about at dental school is vertical preparations. So verti preps, as you may have heard of them, are not a new thing, right? They've been around for a long, long time, decades, because previously we didn't have uh, powerful tools now to drill these chamfers and shoulders. So what dentists would do with these feather edge preparations and they kind of went out of fashion and now they're back in fashion because the modern materials, we can actually mill them to very, very thin and we get to preserve so much tooth structure. So I'm a big believer in vertical preparations. When I don't have enamel or when I want to preserve as much tooth structure as possible, if I want to go subgingival, try and gain some ferrule, these are times that I'll be using a vertical preparation. So I got taught nothing about this. I never knew it existed while I was at dental school and it has been an absolute game changer for me and a lot of my indirect work for when I have decided that this tooth is not the best candidate for adhesion, I will be going vertical preparation and just love how much tooth I'm preserving and how good the soft tissues look. Now, if this is an area that's confusing for you and you want to learn some more, I'm doing a series of five live webinars starting probably in August. If you want to stay in the loop, join protrusive.app premium membership and we'll be doing Verti Prep for Plonkers, a five-part live series that will go on there as well for you to essentially do your first premolar case. So the challenge by the end of these five live webinars is for you to be able to do your first vertiprep on a premolar preparation and cementation, i.e. plonking it on. That's why it's called vertiprep for plonkers. I'm not calling you a plonker. It's like the act of cementing is plonking rather than doing something adhesive, which is much more intricate, right? So I hope you join me for that. And I will put the, the links in the show notes. So thanks so much for listening to this five things I do differently now compared to before. That's extractions, air abrasion, wedge guard, onlays, and vertical preparations. Any other suggestions for episodes, please do hit me up in the comments or on the Protrusive app or on our special Telegram group. I'd love to hear from you. And thanks for watching all the way to the end.